So hello and good morning, everybody. Also now we, we come to the next keynote lecture. And this keynote lecture is given by Andreas Rowald. Andreas did his master's degree in physics and then he did um, a PhD in electrical engineering. He is most interested in building uh, biophysical models uh, of the human body and uh, to translate it into uh, clinical applications. He worked um, at the APFL, he was a PhD student at the APFL and finished just two years ago, 2021. And uh, during that time he became uh, familiar with the Human Brain Project and as a deputy of the group, of the locomotion group, he was deeply involved in the development of stimulation techniques of patients that lost their ability to move after lesion of the spinal cord. So he has also very young in his uh, academic age, uh, he has an impressive number of, of highly visible publications. And I think this is really related also to the fact that we are now at a point where the models that we are developing that are based on uh, physics and also informed by neuroscience insight that they are now capable to go into clinical applications as we have seen it also yesterday from, from Victor Joseph's group, for example. So we are very happy that you accepted our invitation and looking forward to your talk. All right. Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Andreas Rowald. Thank you so much, Katrin, for uh, the uh, introduction. And thank you to all of you for attending my talk today. Special thanks, of course, to everyone in the Human Brain Project, eBrains, and the organization committee to invite me here to talk to you a little bit about uh, my research regarding computational modeling precision neurostimulation, which is, um, you know, by no means, by no stretch of the imagination, a, a new concept, right? In fact, I would say the, the whole history of neurostimulation is very tightly intertwined with the history of computational modeling. And for this, we kind of have to go back, if I can manage to make this work. Voila. We have to kind of go back to the start of the, of the modern era of neurostimulation, which is right around the 1960s, when we start seeing these technologies, like first and foremost, of course, the brain stimulation and then spinal cord stimulation and others being used for, for pain treatment. Now, these devices, although they have dramatically improved technologically over the years, they still follow a very similar concept now as back then with some kind of pulse generator, which is written here, the implantable pulse generator, typically being placed somewhere under the skin in the patient, being programmed through some kind of stimulation programmer to send electrical pulses to electrodes that are distributed across the nervous system at the key location that we actually want to see them. So obviously for the brain stimulation, we have them in the brain, for spinal cord stimulation in the spinal cord, and so on. Now sort of a key time point in this whole axis of neurostimulation is, I would say, the 1980s, when we started rediscovering a lot of these technologies for a whole variety of different conditions. And I think the, the most important here to highlight is probably DBS in, in, in movement disorders, where we started treating essential tremors, Parkinson's disease, and so on, um, with a technology that was originally conceived for, for pain treatment. And then from here on out, we were really off to the races um, that continues until today, but I put a little, po a little stopping point here in the 2010s uh, because I've, I have this uh, nice picture from Krams et al. kind of showing all the different technologies that are already clinically approved and all these future uh, technologies that are currently being used as investigational devices um, and hopefully will find their, their, um, their way into the market. And actually, this, this absolutely needs to be updated because the market is exploding at a rapid pace. So to me, a really important question is to ask myself kind of what happened from the 1980s to today? How did we make this happen? There's several things that happened over the years, but one key point is what I kind of consider the other point of 
of, of the medallion, the other side of the medallion, which is computational modeling. Now, in the 1980s, we started using these really sophisticated models, uh, these numerical models of uh, spinal cord stimulation. In fact, if you look at their, their anatomy, they pretty nicely represent the, the spinal cord anatomy. So this is something that, to be entirely honest, we are not changing so much. We have not really changed that much over the years. We, we actually kept a lot of these methods uh, the same. In fact, we started transitioning them um, to other technologies. So what we see really, really nicely happening is a lot of the technological advancements in computational modeling of spinal cord simulation finding their way into deep brain simulation modeling and then being incredibly improved upon. So here we have just one breakthrough after another right around the 2000s onwards where DBS modeling but also DBS technologies just are exploding in, in, in precision and accuracy of um, both sides of the medallion. To the point where actually nowadays in DBS applications, computational modeling are everywhere from scientific understanding to therapy design to clinical decision support, right? In fact, if you go around the summit and you look at some of the posters, you see wonderful examples of, of, of what is happening in, in, in digital brain research and, and DBS. So I think it makes sense to look at DBS as kind of a, a success story, a blueprint, if you will. What did we do right here, and how can we leverage that in the future? Now again, there's several incredible advancements here, but I think there's kind of three time points I would really like to highlight. The first one was around the 2000s, when we used these combinations of finite element methods and numerical, like conductance-based axon models, in order to understand and shift our understanding from looking at inhibition type scenarios around the soma to direct excitation of axons. A fundamental insight that seems almost to many of you maybe trivial nowadays, but important because when we started coupling this with uh, patient specific models, we could actually start finding patterns, patterns in what kind of axons do we recruit when we stimulate therapeutically versus what kind of axons do we get when we stimulate non-therapeutically? So this kind of pattern recognition, this kind of, um, of, of therapy design essentially led us to identify targets where we want to put electrodes and how we want to stimulate. And then this very same technologies found their way into clinical decision support tools, which are just now routinely used in DBS. So this is an absolute success story of, of what we would now consider digital twins, which, by the, which at that time wasn't really used, it was more of these patient-specific models. So I would like to abstract this out a little bit. Let's zoom out. What did DBS modeling do right? And I think what it did right was it kept the fundamental idea of this clinical empirical research, saying, okay, patients interact with, with clinicians and then a treatment is being applied and we evaluate uh, the patient data, but it added the component of a patient-specific model, a digital twin from the very, very get-go, not from the very get-go, but as soon as it was possible, um, to, to directly ask themselves what hypothesized mechanisms of actions can we link to therapeutic outcomes, and what can we do with this scientific understanding to improve therapy design. Now, these are considerations that are still largely undetermined in many neurostimulation technologies, including spinal cord stimulation, where these parameters such as location, different configuration of electrodes still remains largely undetermined. But in DBS, we've managed to optimize of them quite, quite nicely. But the same framework can be used basically exactly how it is for personalization. So essentially adjusting the stimulation parameters to fit these kinds of targeted modulations to individual anatomies. But DBS is not the only thing that is happening in neurostimulation. In fact, when we look at the neurostimulation market, and here I kept the exact numbers um, vague on purpose because it depends a bit on, on which year you look at, but what you immediately see is that deep brain simulation, although a significant chunk of the neurostimulation market, the biggest, the absolute lion's share, is held by the spinal cord stimulation market. And then we still have several other technologies that make up a very significant part 
of the relative distribution. So by not leveraging what we understood from DBS and how to successfully implement digital twin models into the therapy, we are leaving a lot of money on the table, not just in relative terms, but also in absolute terms, because this market is expanding rapidly. And we need to start focusing on these other technologies more and more, a trend we've seen in the recent years, but we need to expand on it. So let's look at this spinal cord stimulation market, right? This is the biggest share. What's happening here? Well, when you apply stim spinal cord stimulation, there are several things that could be happening because there are several neural structures there. But actually, to this day, we are still not entirely sure what is happening there. We cannot even fully agree which neural structures we're really activating. There are several hypotheses out there, and kind of the most, um, the most dominant ones, I would say, is this recruitment of A-beta fibers in the dorsal column versus A-alpha fibers in the uh, dorsal roots, something that kind of happens between the split of uh, pain treatment and, and movement disorders. But we're not, still not entirely sure what exactly is happening. Probably depends on a lot of factors. Yet, although we don't have a proper mechanistic understanding, the clinical demand, which is increasing dramatically, has pushed technological advancement to the point where we have completely new ways of stimulating. Some advancements are, to some degree, obvious, like increasing the number of channels through which we stimulate, but other advancements are very mysterious, to say the least. Some waveforms that are applied in various ways with no understanding, really, of what exactly it, it's happening in the spinal cord and where even the therapeutic benefits are largely disputed. So we need to build a foundation of understanding if we want to improve this therapy. And similarly, we need, to, we need this foundation of understanding if we want to apply this therapy because let's not forget that these clinical decision support tools, they are not really established in the clinical reality. Because the really sophisticated patient-specific models, what we would call really a digital twin, they've really only started appearing in the last five years, maybe. So we are not anywhere close to somewhere where we would say the model is really pushing the therapy to, to, to new heights. And this is where a lot of my research is, is focused on. In fact, I come from the movement side of spinal cord stimulation because spinal cord stimulation can do many, many things. In fact, we've known that spinal cord stimulation can restore movement since approximately the 70s, which was discovered completely by accident when uh, SES, spinal cord stimulation in short, was um, applied and the, the, the researchers Cook actually, did, actually found a restoration of voluntary movement. Now from here on out, you know, we were, we were shooting off and trying to, to, to make this technology happening in paralyzed subjects. So there were a lot of studies with SEI subjects, and please uh, excuse my, my, uh, my very old school video here. I had to improvise a little bit. Um, we were recruiting spinal cord injured uh, individuals in order to actually elicit movements in, um, in various areas of the, of the um, of the spine in order to determine how we have to stimulate in order to actually elicit um, um, motor function. And then it took until about the 2011s where we really had a subject where we could say this subject was remobilized in some way. But we're still not at the point at this time point where we can say this is a therapy that we can broadly roll out to multiple subjects. That turning point came in 2018 to me. Because at that point, we had three independent groups publishing at pretty much exactly the same time in high-impact factor publications that spinal cord stimulation could be used for the restoration of uh, lower limb motor function in paralyzed individuals after spinal cord injury. Now, I was part of that third group at EPFL and Chief. Uh, in fact, I was doing my PhD in the uh, laboratories of Gregor Kortin and Jocelyn Bloch at the time working on these computational models for all the reasons that I've, I've just listed uh, to you. Now, my approach was not very different to what everybody else was doing. I was building these finite element models with um, some kind of multi-scale component in order to identify what's exactly happening with spinal cord stimulation. The only thing I did was I decided that I would improve the the accuracy of these models as much as I could possibly 
do, from very macroscopic um, anatomical structures to electrical field distributions incorporating anisotropic um, and inhomogeneous um, field tensors into the, the simulation, to even representing several neural structures rather than a very small subset of, of neural structures um, as, as axon cable models using a multi-compartmental approach to say, all right, this is probably the most advanced version I've ever seen. Hopefully this tells me something that the other models have not yet told me. So then leveraging this approach, I was building these recruitment patterns to basically see the order of effects, what's happening one after another, because surely all these things are happening at the same time. And I basically came to the conclusion that, well, in humans, it seems to be that within a therapeutic window, we're predominantly focusing on A-alpha fibers, large diameter myelinated efferent fibers, i.e. proprioceptive efferents, um, in the dorsal root, ipsilateral, close to the electrode. And that makes sense because the activation function, function concept tells us that wherever the second derivative of the electric field is very high, meaning that wherever the fiber bends a lot, that's really a prime target to activate uh, that particular neural structure. So um, the dorsal root entry zone where we assume the fibers to go in, that seems to be a prime target. So by targeting these structures, we can get individual roots to be recruited but we don't have one individual root. We actually have a whole lot of individual roots and they correspond to different muscles. And ultimately what we want is we want to be able to selectively activate one muscle over another, elicit those motor reflexes. So as an example, if I want to get my hip flexor muscle to, uh, to contract, if I want a hip flexion, I need to stimulate the root that corresponds to that hip flexion. And I want, if I want a knee extension, I need to stimulate that root that corresponds to a knee extension. So what I need is some kind of spatial distribution of my electric field in order to increase field focality at key points. Easy, right? Well, not entirely, because there's still sort of a temporal aspect to this. At the end of the day, we still have to couple that somehow with our neural network and understand how the locomotion actually happens in the presence of these artificially induced uh, motor reflexes. And initially, we thought this was you know, working in synergy, but it turns out that depending on several factors, there are actually sometimes counterproductive uh, overlapping effects. Like for example, the deletion of proprioceptive sensory information that would naturally occur during locomotion if there was no stimulation present. And this sensory information may be sensible to have, right? And if we were to delete it by stimulation, that would probably impair our capacity to to elicit uh, locomotion. So we need to not just be spatially, but also temporally very precise in how we actually target um, these individual proprioceptive efferent fibers. All right, let's put this to the test then. Well, what we need is across the spinal cord of a subject, we need to target very specific hotspots spatially, but also temporally. So now we basically need to do this across lots and lots of different uh, individuals. So what we immediately start realizing at that point is that if we apply the electrode leads that basically everyone was using at that time because they were repurposed for, for pain treatment, well then, just for very, very trivial reasons, simply due to dimensions, we're just simply not gonna cover the entire spinal cord. So we immediately have a problem. We need a different lead, a lead that is actually targeted to that specific application that um, we want to target. So now we're in the therapy design concept. We need a lead that is somehow going to cover the entire lumbosacral spinal cord uh, to be able to get all the different electrodes. And that gives us our first design cue really here. We need to put electrodes at the uh, rostral and caudal end. But where exactly, right? So here we can leverage these computational models to ask ourselves what would happen if I were to have an electrode at a particular location. So if I were to put lots and lots of electrodes in a grid, right, and I were to take a particular row of that grid, how would the recruitment patterns look like of different routes versus the targeted route here in red? At what point would I really be getting that route selectively? Then we can interpolate this and put it mathematically into some kind of representation, which we call the selectivity index, and then saying, all right, wherever this is very yellow, that's probably a good point to put your electrode. 
But this is assuming that when we place that lead, it's going to be at the perfect position, which, you know, as, as, as dexterous as neurosurgeons are, there is going to be some misplacement in there. But we don't just have one electrode, right? We have several electrodes. So could we recover some of the selectivity lost if a misplacement were to happen, if I find another lead, another grid distribution here? So that would immediately tell me where a second electrode would have to be placed to be able to steer the current around to increase field focality around multipolar configurations. And then finally, we have a bit of a, of a strange anatomical feature in, uh, in the sacral region of the, of the spinal cord where several roots are aggregating together. And this, they basically have a sort of transversal arrangement in, um, in, in in the um, cerebrospinal fluid. Now, if we were to emulate that transverse arrangement with electrodes, we could maybe focus electric fields away from unwanted roots towards wanted, desired roots. Now, these design cues that were essentially then incorporated into the design of an electrode lead that was then, um, um, that was then produced by uh, Onward Medical to be tested in uh, paralyzed individuals with spinal cord injury. But there was still one consideration we still had to make at this point, which is we know that if we place electrode leads in the spine relative to the spinal cord, which is here in blue, they can actually kind of be anywhere. And that's because, again, we don't really have these robust clinical decision support tools, right? something that is likely related and maybe even exaggerated by the presence of these vast inter-individual variabilities in, in physiology. Meaning what we need is really robust tools to be able to place that electrode at that location where we want it. And we already have the framework in place, right? We already have MRI sequences that are high resolution enough, but yet clinically relevant to be deployed across any clinic to rebuild the anatomy of individual subjects and leverage CT scans in order to rebuild certain heart tissues. Now we additionally couple this with some fMRI uh, techniques in order to really localize the hotspots of activation. Essentially, where do we assume um, proprioceptive activity to elicit a, a, a motor reflex? And then transfer this into a biophysical model where we can use placement parameterization in order to test various stimulation configurations, and therefore extrapolate an optimal placement of the lead. So this hypothesis optimal lead placement can then be used for preoperative treatment planning, essentially determining you know, where laminectomy, where the laminectomy has to happen, where, how, how far should that lead actually go, which, which context should respond to which particular um, functionality, and then actually guide intrasurgically the, the intervention. From here on out, it's a question of confirmation, right? So after the surgery, after some rest period for the, for the patient, we would program these stimulators with these configurations in order to determine if the individual motor reflexes would be triggered robustly for every single patient, right? So can we do a knee extension? Can we do a whole leg flexion? Do we get these individual motor functionalities on a per subject basis? At which point we just have to put them together, right? So our question was, could we do that very quickly? And indeed we could. In all three of our study participants, we were actually able to elicit locomotion within a single day, right? So within a single day, all three people with paralysis due to spinal cord injury were walking on a treadmill. And that despite the fact that the spinal cords couldn't be any more different, the care we took preoperatively immediately translated into reduction of, of clinical effort, reduction of time. We could now transition to an actual uh, therapeutic intervention. And that's a therapeutic intervention that we have to give back to the patient. A therapeutic intervention they should be in control of in some manner. They should be the ones who are eliciting the stimulation, not us. So a very simple trick, and there's various ways you can do this, but a very simple trick is to le simply leverage this kind of clicker uh, system where on each side of the walker of, of the patient, you mount a button and you link each button to a particular stimulation paradigm corresponding to parts of a gate cycle. So then, essentially, they can trigger walking on the left and right side, taking individual steps, and then 
put them in a sequence that would actually enable them to, well, quite frankly, go anywhere, right? They can now take this walker and walk out of the laboratory into the environment that they walk, want to go at, and uh, use them for at-home training, use them for, for training in, in, in different environments, make adjustments to the stimulation based on expert opinion that can then be leveraged to transition to different um, environments. Now, a great success, right? And there's several more things um, to do here. We, can, we, we have to make this technology something that is robustly uh, able to be rolled out to uh, patient populations. But there's more to this whole section of spinal cord stimulation than just, in quotation marks, uh, lower limb motor function. In fact, in the last few years, we've seen an absolute explosion of applications. Everything from upper limb function in stroke patients to um, blood pressure regulations to bladder control and many, many, many more. So we have several application scenarios with different functionalities that have the potential to be, to be, um, to be tackled through spinal cord stimulation. So what is really missing here? Well, what's missing is for us to identify what paradigms we need to use in order to selectively trigger each particular uh, functionality. And for this, what we need is really neuroanatomical information. I've seen incredible neuroanatomical information of the brain in this summit. It's really fascinating, the development that has, that has happened here, but we're still lacking very much on the spinal cord here. In fact, the most sophisticated model I've ever seen was by Greiner et al. in uh, 2021, where actually these nerve fibers, they have actual branches, and they branch out into the dorsal column and, and the gray matter and so on. But we should not forget that you know, this information, although already very, very great, right? Massive improvement over what people have been using for 20 years, essentially, comes from morphological data from cats decades ago, right? How reliable is that information really? What I really would like to see is, is the spinal cord in, in a resolution that I can actually improve my models with. And that would not only transfer to novel applications, but also to technologies that are focused on the user needs. Because although in, in severe cases, invasive technologies are absolutely great and fascinating, and we, we need to roll them out, at the moment, a lot of patients with less severe cases, they would prefer a cost time and risk limited alternative, an alternative that necessarily is going to be less precise by its very nature. But the precision we lose from the stimulation technology is precision we need to recover through the computational model. It is precision that we know we can recover based on examples that we've seen in the field of non-invasive deep brain stimulation. We need to start transitioning this to also the spinal cord, which is going to have several challenges ahead of us that we not need to, to address on a technical aspect of things. So first and foremost, everything I showed you today was built on a little computer that I purchased for a few thousand euros, right? Something we haven't really addressed yet is the problem of high performance computing and spinal cord stimulation. So something that absolutely needs to happen are these large scale parameter explorations. We have so many parameters from electrolocation to shape to, to design to, to waveforms, frequencies and so on, and we are barely scratching the surface of this entire parameter space. If we were to sweep over it and actually start optimizing it, then we could maybe identify those therapies that would actually yield precise functional recovery and symptom relief for individual patient populations. But this problem isn't the only thing. We, we also need the other side of the coin, these locally deployable systems. They're not bad by any stretch of the uh, imagination. They're, in fact, amazing for several uh, questions regarding patient data privacy, so clinical decision support tools, how can we actually use them in a, in a, a clinical setting. Oftentimes we want user-centric systems that maybe don't need the level of complexity, so then, you know, what are we doing with the, with the high-performance computing clusters? And also, I, my dream is still ha to have the actual simulation be in closed loop with the stimulation, so actually wearable systems that can adjust, um, that can adjust stimulation online, essentially. 
But for this, we need to first and foremost address the question of complexity, sensitivity, and uncertainty, something we really haven't paid much attention to uh, in the last years. So it's partially my fault, actually. Um, so we need to ask ourselves, how complex do we need to be on a locally deployable systems? Because I started building these insanely anatomically accurate models that people have rejected for, for the longest time to put development into it uh, because they weren't sure if, if there, was, there was actually going to be a return to it. And now I find myself in the position asking myself, yes, they are useful, but can I maybe get away with a slightly less computationally expensive approach, but create a minimally valuable product for the clinical reality? And then use instead this incredibly accurate model on the high performance computing clusters and then have a link between them where I can actually build things that directly touch the patient locally but then can be verified and optimized in the high performance computing cluster and then move back. Which asks a lot of questions, not just on a technological side but also in terms of, um, of, of, of how we're doing this in terms of patient data privacy, economic consideration because Yes, absolutely. If we want to make these models part of the therapy, then this needs to become a product. And if I've learned one thing from working with all these clinic stuff, and I'm just showing the neurosurgeons here because okay, nothing more important in my life than actually being in the surgery room. Uh, so very big thanks to them, especially Jocelyn Bloch for, for giving me the opportunity to do that, is we need the communication with the end users. We need to understand what these stakeholder groups actually need from this product in order to help them help other people. And if nothing else, that's something I want to, to, to give you today, which is I believe that the computation model is not separate from the therapy, but it is really an integral part of the therapy, and we absolutely need to make this happen, not just for DBS, but across the entire neurostimulation market. And with this, I would like to thank you all so much for your attention, and of course, thank all the people who have touched my academic career over the years, especially all the patients who have put their, their trust in me and our team. So thank you very much.